We are currently working our way through the book of Acts. Understandably, our service is a little bit longer this morning, but I have attempted to approximately shave off the time I spent talking about leadership off the sermon. That might make not much difference, we'll see. And we do have spare Bibles, as mentioned, and outlines, if that's helpful to follow along. So the first couple of um, chapters in Acts have been pretty eventful, haven't they? Covering two very important events in redemptive church history. Firstly, in chapter one, we saw the ascension of Christ as Jesus gave his final command to the disciples, telling them to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. As we know, Jesus was speaking of the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples. And then in chapter two, after 10 days of waiting, we see that promise fulfilled. The second important event in redemptive history in these chapters takes place, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a very dramatic and supernatural occurrence as the Holy Spirit came with the sound of a mighty rushing wind and the appearance of tongues of fire over the disciples. And also this resulted in them speaking miraculously languages and dialects unknown to them. This led to thousands of devout Jews within Jerusalem being drawn to what was happening and acknowledging that God was working a miracle before their eyes. Peter then stands up to address the multitudes, showing them that this was all taking place in fulfilment of God's word, and he powerfully and passionately preaches Christ, proclaiming the gospel to this incredibly captive audience. And the result of this, as we saw last week and we'll see again today, was that through the power of the Holy Spirit upon Peter's preaching, sinners were convicted, Sinners were converted as 3,000 souls got saved. And this was, of course, the greatest miracle that took place on the day of Pentecost, which is something people can often miss when reading this well-known and often misunderstood chapter. Now, when the Holy Spirit came upon and filled the disciples in the upper room, they were permanently indwelt with the Holy Spirit from that moment onwards. Since that time, this has been the experience for all believers upon conversion as the Holy Spirit empowers them for service and enables them to become more and more like Christ. This was in stark contrast to the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit came upon God's people in a more specific, temporary way, specific people, specific purposes. And so on this day in church history, the body of Christ came into being for the first time. And that's why Christians refer to this day of Pentecost as the day that officially marks the beginning of the church. As we know, this is all part of God's plan from eternity past, which is why Jesus said the following words to Peter, even before the disciples knew anything about waiting in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 16, 18, he said, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So as we continue on from here in the book of Acts, we're going to see how the church becomes established and how it grows and spreads throughout the world. And as the gospel is taken from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm always amazed when I think about this, considering where we live here in New Zealand. Although there are still obviously many places that are still unreached around the world today, in the context of Jesus' words in chapter 1, verse 8 of Acts, when he called the disciples to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, of course, from where Jesus and the disciples actually stood when he said these things, we are geographically the furthest country on the planet away from Jerusalem. Literally, Auckland itself is the fourth furthest city from Jerusalem with Lower Hutt, Hamilton, and Tauranga being the only other places further away from Jerusalem than us here in Auckland. So that means from the disciples' perspective, we are the uttermost parts of the earth. And Alvin and Valerie are the utter, utter, uttermost parts of the earth. <laughs> so praise God for Samuel Marsden and the other missionaries who brought the gospel here to New Zealand over 200 years ago in fulfilment, in a sense, in, of what was being said. Not complete fulfilment, but in obedience to the Great Commission given by Christ. So this morning, as we look at this passage from verses 40 to 47, in addition to seeing how the disciples manage this incredible revival, we're going to see some key truths in regard to God's intended means to grow the church, his way, and some of the results and blessings of genuine biblical church growth. So the title of this morning's message is Church Growth, the Biblical Way. I'll just read these verses and we'll pray and look into them in more detail. Acts 1, 
Acts 2, 40 to 47. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray that as your word is brought forth, that you would speak to us, that we would hear from you, and that we would respond to you in faith. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter has just proclaimed the gospel to this incredibly attentive crowd. As he preached Christ from the Old Testament scripture, the Holy Spirit worked mightily. And we see the result of this in verses 40 and 41. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptised and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. This didn't mean 3,000 cards were handed in or that 3,000 people prayed the sinner's prayer. It means that about 3,000 souls were soundly and genuinely saved and this will happen in one day. This is also a reminder to us that the Bible uses grammatical terms that are sometimes approximate, which helps us to know what to take literally and what not to take literally. When it says about 3,000 souls here, it's simply saying around that figure. And let's face it, it wouldn't have been the easiest job to count it all up. And so the writer says about 3,000. But it wasn't 2,200. And as I said last week, it wasn't them being evangelistic in any way whatsoever. Either way, this is an undoubtable, incredible response. And powerfully, the Spirit works in people's hearts and brings about this revival. In human terms, it was also a logistical nightmare. But I don't doubt for one second they were all saying, this is a very good problem to have, stop complaining. Now imagine if when we did one of our street outreaches here in Wellsford that the people just kept coming up and taking tracks and falling on their knees in repentance and this just kept happening all day long as people tell others what's happened to them. And then by 9pm that night, we estimated about 3,000 people have been saved and they're all looking forward to coming to church on Sunday. (laughs) It helps us to understand what was happening here a little bit more. In verse 40, we see that Peter spoke many more words than what we have recorded here, but we can know that we have all the words that God wanted us to read. This also helps us preachers because it prevents someone making a case for Peter's sermon only being five minutes, resulting in 3,000 people being saved. The fact is we know he spoke many other words, and so it's good that we follow his example. Peter both testified and exhorted those he was preaching to. Testified speaks of bearing witness earnestly, repeatedly, or to charge as if before witnesses. It carries the idea of giving a forceful order or directive. Exhorted speaks of urging someone to take some action. It's the best way to describe what occurs through preaching. You are not just wanting to fill people's minds with information. This is not a lecture. You are burdened and zealous for them to apply what they hear and actually do something about it. I love Spurgeon's phrase. He said that preaching is your attempt to screw truth into men's heads. Of course, he means men and women, but that's what Spurgeon said. Of course, there can be nothing more important to exhort a person to do than to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter's doing here is he says, be saved from this perverse generation. This was a strong statement, literally a command in the original to be saved from this world that is perverse, warped, crooked, deviant. The only description for a world that has turned its back on God and his word. Now, logistically, the disciples had already done a great job here because by verse 41, the 3,000 new converts had all been baptised. And in that, it would have been a mission just in itself. And I love how it says here, those who gladly received his word were baptised. 
Doesn't that just describe so beautifully hearts that were softened to the message of the gospel? Hearts that were soft soil, not stony or thorny ground. And this is a response we always want to pray for when we share the gospel. But as we saw last week, the response has nothing to do with us. Yes, God will use our words to communicate his means to bring the gospel. But other than that, our job is simply to bring the message with clarity, back it up in the way that we live, and pray that the Holy Spirit would do the work of conviction and conversion. But what a joy it is to see someone gladly receive the good news of the gospel. What a blessing it would have been to see 3,000 devout Jews confessing publicly through water baptism their newfound faith in Christ, renouncing their trust in the works of the flesh and their attempts to live by the law as they now trusted in Christ alone by faith, surrendering their lives to Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. And so as we consider some key truths in regard to God's intended means to grow the church his way and the results of that, What we see in verses 40 and 41 here is this. Biblical church growth begins with a genuine response to the gospel. Biblical church growth begins with a genuine response to the gospel. It's the only way it can begin. In other words, true church growth has nothing to do with the amount of people in a building. What I mean by this is you could have a church that gains 50 new members in a three-week period, and we can say praise God for that if those people needed a spiritual home or out of fellowship or had legitimate reasons for changing churches. But such a growth in numbers does not mean the body of Christ itself has grown or that anyone new has been saved. One of the reasons we need to acknowledge this is if we catch ourselves relaxing a little, if we're in a church that's growing in numbers, but that growth is not related to new conversions. Again, we can totally praise God when a local assembly grows for the various reasons this may happen. But above all, the greatest growth we can pray for is genuine conversion. Let me put it this way. It's actually a greater reason to rejoice if you had two new converts in a church of 300 than if you had 300 new members in a church of 100, but all of those members were already Christians. But as you can understand, it would seem the greater rejoicing would occur in the latter. And this kind of echoes the heart of Jesus in Luke 15, 7, when he said, I say to you that likewise, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And by using the word repent, he's making it clear. One sinner who has turned from sin, trusted in Christ. is a genuine sinner has been converted. Over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So when we talk about church growth today as well, as we see in the passage, it relates to both numerical growth as the body of Christ grows and depth of growth in spiritual maturity. We speak of both when we speak about church growth today. Breadth and depth. One pastor I used to listen to often said, you take care of the depth in your church and let God take care of the breadth. And there's a lot of truth to that. Children, here's your first point this morning. After a person becomes a Christian, they learn what it means to follow Christ. A follower of Christ is called a disciple. You see, children, when people follow Christ, that's what a disciple is. And that's what a Christian is, which is why we say a Christian is not just someone who says, I'm a Christian, but a Christian is someone who follows Christ. Let's continue on verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This is probably the verse we'll spend most time on from the passage because it's such a key verse when it comes to these essential elements of a local church. Those practices that are indispensable, those practices that if set aside or ignored would mean you could not really call that gathering a church. There are others, but here are four of the most important ones here. It says here right after the revival when 3,000 were saved and baptised that what followed this was an intentional, consistent, dedicated pattern of spiritual life that became the pattern all churches should follow from this moment onwards. It says they continued steadfastly in four main practices. The phrase continued steadfastly could also be described as continually devoting themselves. It's in the imperfect tense, so it speaks of an action that was ongoing and occurring over and over and over again. So clearly these believers were not half-hearted in their commitment to the things of God. Gathering with God's people was not a casual part of their lives. 
It wasn't a take it or leave it approach, depends what I've got on on Sunday approach. These people were thoroughly devoted to what? Again, four main things, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, speaking of communion, and prayer. So let's look first at the apostles' doctrine. It's no coincidence we see the priority of doctrine here, speaking of biblical teaching. The church begins, 3,000 are saved, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine first. This was to be the basis for all these believers would think, believe, do and teach. And it's the same for us today. Now at this time, it's important to understand this, the authority of God's word resided in the apostles and was affirmed by signs and wonders, as we'll see shortly. That was what authenticated the authority of God's word. The words the apostles spoke carried a unique authority as the canon of scripture was gradually being formed and as the early church grew and became established. We read about this foundational role the apostles and the early church prophets played in Ephesians 2, verse 19. Paul says, Now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And I've talked about this before. Christ the cornerstone, apostles and prophets the foundation, the church is built upon that. Biblical teaching has many purposes. It is instructive, corrective, it brings comfort, perspective, purpose, hope. As God's word is taught, Christ is present, working in the lives of his people through the sanctifying work of the spirit. And believers grow spiritually, becoming more like Christ. Scripture is completely sufficient for these things, as we're reminded in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And it says it so clearly there. The word of God is sufficient to make us complete and thoroughly equipped. Then, as we heard when we appointed our leaders earlier on, the word of God is such a priority, there is never a time it is to be put on hold or neglected. We are to preach the word in season and out of season, when convenient, when not convenient. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. And no church will ever truly grow, no Christian will ever truly grow, unless their life is built upon the rock of God's word. And I've said this a few times, and I... And I I believe it with all my heart. You'll never find a mature, fruitful Christian whose life is devoid of the word of God and engagement with and commitment to the local church and the means of grace. You just won't find them. It might look like that on the outside. That may be that for a short period, but for a sustained period of someone's life to be apart from those things, It just doesn't happen. It can't happen. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Doctrine is not something that just fills our minds. It enlarges our hearts, deepens our awe and wonder of God's greatness and goodness. So it's probably good to ask ourselves, how much do we value and seek to grow in doctrine or is that one of those more sort of stuffy intellectual things that the serious Christians do doctrine reveals Christ is greater God is more incredible and it stirs our affections so the first point related to church growth from this verse verse 42 is this biblical church growth is built upon the foundation and proclamation of sound doctrine It's how it begins, it's how it's maintained. Biblical church growth is built upon the foundation and proclamation of sound doctrine. The next essential aspect we see in verse 42 is fellowship. The word used for fellowship here in the Greek is koinonia. The word occurs 20 times in the Bible. It speaks about being in agreement with one another, united in purpose, and serving alongside one another. As believers, our koinonia is based on our common koinonia with Jesus Christ. So fellowship then is not just friendship, is it? It's much deeper than that. It's why it should look totally different here on a Sunday to the golf club today or the bowling club 
Friendship is something based on mutual interests and often formed between people who are similar in their likes and dislikes. Whereas fellowship is based around our relationship with Christ. And that's why within the church, you can have close fellowship. You can rejoice with and weep with people from totally different backgrounds, cultures, ages and personalities. Let's face it, people that apart from Christ, you probably would have thought, I wouldn't have necessarily had much time for them (laughs) or been interested in being around them. Fellowship is also something we're devoted to because of Christ. Whereas friendships can often end when there's conflict or disagreement. In fellowship, however, God requires us to work through those things and to pursue reconciliation as much as possible. So may we be encouraged to engage intentionally in fellowship, not just spending time with the people we get along with or the people that we get something from, but to love others to genuinely invest in others and encourage others simply because they're brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what sets the church apart. That's how the world outside see our love for one another. Fellowship helps to build up the body of Christ as we practice the one another's. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. And there's so many, just a few. Scripture commands us to be devoted to one another, to honour one another, to live in harmony with one another to serve one another in love, to be kind and compassionate to one another, to admonish one another, to encourage one another, and to offer hospitality and love one another. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is what true biblical koinonia should look like. Now, Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 is a key passage that speaks of the importance of coming together in person for fellowship on the Lord's Day. As we know, these verses very much shaped our thinking and our action when our government was calling for churches to set aside fellowship during lockdown, as if it wasn't vitally important to us. These are not the only verses to make that case. But Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And we have Paul's words to the Philippians, which also speak in detail about the quality and nature of true Christian fellowship. Philippians 2, 1 to 4. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, have the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more important than yourselves. Let each of you look out not to his own interests, but the interests of others. And lastly, fellowship will always be hindered and unity will always be prevented if believers are unwilling to walk in the light, which speaks of transparency and openness. 1 John 1, 6 to 7, speak of this. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Another point from this verse then, biblical church growth takes place within the context of loving, Christ-centered fellowship among brothers and sisters in Christ. Biblical church growth takes place within the context of loving Christ-centered fellowship among brothers and sisters in Christ. The next essential element of church life we see in verse 42 is communion, or described here, the breaking of bread. Some commentators believe it may have been a broader term, but would certainly have included this. We hear these verses often, but what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26 about the Lord's Supper simply highlights the importance of this. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. In baptism, we proclaim um, the Lord's, the life that he's brought us. And in communion, we proclaim his death. 
In communion, we remember Christ, and as we do, we commune with Christ. Communion, remember, is a means of grace. You mustn't forget that. In other words, we are strengthened spiritually by communion as the Lord meets us at his table. Commentator David Guzik makes an interesting observation of this first instances of communion within the early church. He says, even living so close to the time when Jesus was crucified, they still never wanted to forget what he did on the cross. How much more important is it for us in our day to never forget? So let us value and appreciate the times we get to take communion together as we will at the conclusion of this message. Another point then here from that is biblical church growth is purified and strengthened through the regular practice of communion. Biblical church growth is purified and strengthened through the regular practice of communion. And what I mean by that is as the church grows in breadth and depth, the practice of communion helps us to keep short accounts. It helps us to deal with sin, and because of this, the church is purified as well as strengthened. Sin will destroy our lives if not confessed and dealt with. Sin will destroy a church if not confessed and dealt with, but God has made provision, abundant provision through communion for that not to happen, and we can be thankful. 1 John 1, 8 to 9 It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The last essential element of church life we see here in verse 42 is the practice of prayer. How important this is in the life of the church and for spiritual growth within the church. There's one area that we should seek to consistently be growing in as a church, and I'm sure personally it is the practice of prayer. Consistent prayer, dependent prayer, heartfelt prayer, and confident prayer with our confidence in the promises of God and the goodness of God. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. I love what Alistair Begg says about prayer. He says, prayer is an acknowledgement that our need of God's help is not partial but total. Yet many of our church prayer meetings have dwindled in size and influence. Ultimately, the explanation can be traced to spiritual warfare. If, as the hymn writer says, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees then we may be sure that he and his minions will be working hard to discredit the value of united prayer. The evil one has scored a great victory in getting sincere believers to waver in their conviction that prayer is necessary and powerful. Of course, it sounds better in a Scottish accent, but I wasn't going to attempt that. We live in such a fast-paced world. There's so many things going on. It's difficult to focus our minds in prayer, isn't it? We easily get restless and distracted. It takes discipline and diligence to persist in prayer, to grow in prayer as a church and as individuals. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Colossians 4, 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Ian Bounds said of prayer, prayer should not be regarded as a duty which must be performed. I suppose we better pray. Come on, let's get together but rather a privilege to be enjoyed, a rare delight that is always revealing some new beauty. Is that the way we think of prayer? Philippians 4, 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Whether it's an individual, as a church, If we rest on our own understanding, we're done for. We won't cope. If we rest upon Christ through prayer, he will give us a peace that passes our understanding. He will take away the anxiety. May we grow more and more as a praying church to the glory of God. So on this, I would say biblical church growth is facilitated and sustained through a devotion to corporate prayer. Biblical church growth is facilitated and sustained through a devotion to corporate prayer. Again, I don't think you'll find a thriving church that never prays. 
So what a treasure of truth in this verse here, <clears throat> with these four essential elements of church life, they so contribute towards biblical church growth. And it should be very evident to us all that these practices can only be effectively carried out in person. Now that point has been laboured here <laughs> over the last year, but it's this verse that brings it out very clearly as the church gathers together. Children, your second point is this. Four of the most important things a church can do is have biblical teaching, communion, prayer, and fellowship. Four of the most important things a church can do is have biblical teaching, communion, prayer, and fellowship. Because kids, this is how we grow to be more like Christ. So continuing on then, verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, as I mentioned earlier... The purpose of these wonders and signs was to authenticate the words spoken by the apostles. It was to affirm their authority to speak on behalf of God, because they literally would speak, and this was the word of God. This was the authority of God. We cannot do that today unless we are reading the word of God. Now, we have this in a complete format. We no longer need wonders and signs to verify our words, man's words, as being God's words, rather the Bible itself is self-testifying. It is the greatest authority in faith and conduct. This doesn't mean that God can't do wonders and signs. God can do whatever he wants. But we understand how God operates through his word, and he tells us that it is not his ascribed means for the church age in which we presently live. Now we have the entirety of God's word. That is our authority. Continuing in verse 43. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now to correctly understand what is happening here, how it does and doesn't apply to us today, we really need to consider the context. 3,000 people radically saved all of a sudden in one day. A massive logistical challenge. Their lives turned around They weren't going anywhere at this point. And that was not what most had planned as they were visiting for the day of Pentecost. Yet now they were a spiritual family of brothers and sisters who went from 120 to 3,120, about, in one day. The bottom line was this. They needed to help each other out. They needed to pull resources to survive and get by. Many would have lost their income or known that they were going to lose their income because of coming to Christ in their Jewish community. So much would have been lost, and there was a great, great need. So what do they do? They help each other out. But what is so important to understand here is they were addressing a crisis situation, and in doing so, were willing to give sacrificially to help each other out. What I mean by that is there's nothing at all in this verse to suggest that the norm for Christians is some sort of communal living where everybody shares everything equally, which hardly ever works anyway, as people often find out the hard way. This is not some form of Christian communism or basis for equal property rights and even distribution. Now, the social justice preachers will try to twist this verse, I'm sure, put it on a T-shirt and serve their purposes, but that's not what it's about. It's not what's happening here. The best way I've ever heard it explained you can say that when you didn't come up with it, of course, is this. Christian communism can be described as the attitude of what's yours is mine. In other words, nothing really belongs to anyone. We all have equal rights to each other's property. That's not what is happening here in verse 43. What is happening here is something we'd do better to call Christian communism, which is described as the attitude not of what's yours is mine, but rather what's mine is yours. When there's a need. We retain the rights to our own property and resources as believers, but in reality, it all belongs to God. And so we must hold lightly to all we possess and be willing to help brothers and sisters in Christ sacrificially when they are in need. In Luke 6, 38, Jesus said, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. In James 2, 15 to 17, we read, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needful for the body, what does it profit? 
Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So in relation to church growth, what I see here is this. Biblical church growth produces a Christ-like community in which believers sacrificially meet one another's needs. Biblical church growth produces a Christ-like community in which believers sacrificially meet one another's needs. And what a blessing it is to see in practice, and what a blessing it is that we know we have seen this happen in our own church many times. And I praise God for that. Children, your third point. The church is a spiritual family where we help meet each other's needs as we serve Christ together and bring the gospel to the lost. Children, you have your biological family, but the church is your spiritual family, and that's why we help one another out. Verse 46, and the first part of verse 47. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. In 46, in the first part of 47 here, we see a beautiful picture of a growing church, growing in breadth and depth, a church united in one purpose, devoted to one another in fellowship and worship, and this is having an impact on the community around them. We're never to compromise, and sometimes our good works and our godly works that God has called us to will bring us into disrepute with the community and we're probably in a season now that that's going to happen more than ever before but it is not the church's job to please the community but it doesn't always have to be this way we can let our light shine as much as possible without compromise we can be known for what we do that is a blessing to the community not just what we think or believe that the world outside doesn't care about or agree with And so a point we can make on this is as follows. Biblical church growth fosters unity, encourages praise to God, and is a witness of the love of Christ to the world outside. Biblical church growth fosters unity, encourages praise to God, and is a witness of the love of Christ to the world outside. It's a witness of the love of Christ to the world outside, even if the world outside says that is not love, as long as we are doing our part right. Now, in the last part of verse 47 that we'll finish with, we read these encouraging words that remind us again of God's willingness to do only what he can do when we commit ourselves to doing all he has called us to do. Simply says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, this was not a cause-effect result or an obligation God had because the disciples did certain things in certain ways or followed certain formulas or certain programs. If you do this, God will do this. This was simply God's grace at work. And it's always about God's grace as he wants to do it in his sovereignty. He looked upon his children. He blessed them in their obedience and faithfulness. Our part is not to produce the fruit but to be faithful to what God has called us to do, to gather, to commit to one another in fellowship, to grow in the word of God, to pray together, to prioritise the means of grace as we come together on the Lord's day. And once those things are in place, we just leave everything in the hands of God. If he wants to grow the body of Christ as represented by this church by one person in the next year, by God's grace, let that happen. If he wants to grow it by 100, by God's grace, let it happen. 1 Corinthians 3, 7, So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. That's what true biblical church growth looks like. These things that we've seen, the blessings, the results of that. So may we devote ourselves to those things and pray for those things for God's glory. The fact is, church life is pretty simple. One of the most difficult things is keeping it simple. But it is simple. So the final point then I'll leave you with. Biblical church growth is not produced by methods, programs, or formulas, but by the sovereign grace of God. Biblical church growth is 
is not produced by methods, programs or formulas, but by the sovereign grace of God. I hope that's been an encouragement to us in regard to what true biblical church growth is, what it looks like, and may the Lord grow us according to his purposes in breadth and depth for his glory. Amen. We'll pray and then Jason's going to come up and lead us in a time of communion. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for a church family, Lord, that have a desire and an appetite for your word, for prayer, for fellowship, for communion. May we grow in these things. And Lord, we just commit our church into your hands, our efforts. It's about you, Lord, your plans, your purposes. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.